our internal combustion engine. We're going to take this flywheel, actually we're going to throw it away. Normally we would cut these teeth off of here and lighten it, but we're going to get some professional help with this mating project from VAC Motorsports. VAC Motorsports in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. They have a uh, really nice shop. They do mostly BMW racing uh, um, specialties and in fact have kind of a race team and uh, uh, do race cars and racing engines uh, for a lot of people but they have since Mini Cooper is part of the BMW line now added a uh, Mini Cooper line and are quite familiar with these transmissions so we're gonna just get a uh, lightweight aluminum flywheel from them to replace this um, flywheel it'll probably be less money than having this one machined and fooling with it and it'll certainly be a lighter flywheel we're gonna keep the clutch and um, this is a brand new one um, in the speedster we got us a pretty nice racing clutch and so forth <laughs> but we don't usually use the clutch at all I want to keep it it's your kind of your last emergency disconnect um, if something went wrong with the control system and for some reason you couldn't shut down your motor uh, you can always pop the clutch and blow the motor up That's instead right. of killing yourself right. and, and die. so we're gonna keep the clutch and pressure plate this uh, Getrag transmission I'm very excited about um, this is a marvelous piece of uh, German engineering a six-speed gearbox and three of the speeds our overdrive oh. uh, less than one zero um, turning and I think that's going to be a huge advantage uh, with an electric motor we found on the Speedster third and fourth gear were our favorites and I could have used the fifth an overdrive gear um, would have taken us to uh, an even higher uh, top speed so this six-speed transmission which we tried you know with the gasoline engine I fell in love with instantly the shift mechanism here is just a, a thing of beauty um, and of course here's your where's our drive shafts go to e each of the front wheels um, we did a drive shaft pull earlier so that's our transmission the idea is we need to get it mated to an electric motor that's it and this is our beastie <coughs> this motor and controller this is the MESDEA 200-250 motor. They make an entire line of these from about, I'd say, 10 kilowatt up to, this one's rated at 30 kilowatt, <coughs> which would be about 45 horsepower. In truth, um, we measure these things, again, somewhat differently with electric motors than we do with uh, gasoline motors. And I'm very uh, taken with uh, sort of an accidental um, bit of serendipity in selecting this motor. This thing's 135 pounds. It's water cooled. We're going to have to run water cooling to this. It's a very compact engine, and you can do that when you're going to run a water cooled system. Water is uh, uh, several orders of magnitude actually better at heat transfer than air is and so you can do a smaller package but you have the additional complexity and possible leaks of a water-cooled system both the controller this is a Tim's um, 600 controller from the same company it's a, and with most of these AC systems um, you you need a match controller and motor going out and trying to pick a controller and match it with a motor uh, just doesn't work there's some parameters in AC induction motors that have to be uh, almost a mathematical correlation between the phase rotation of the uh, controller and uh, the AC motor. The motor will lag a little bit of slip behind the phase rotation and you have to monitor that and control it. It's a, a considerably different um, um, situation from a regular pulse width modulated controller. We described with the Speedster how we take the accelerator input and convert that 
to a uh, chopped signal, basically a square wave, where we vary the pulse width uh, to get an average DC current. This works somewhat similarly, except you have three phases. It's a sine wave, and, um, and you again have to take an accelerator input and um, um, use that to uh, control the uh, um, uh, essentially the amplitude of the three uh, sine waves that you use with the three phase motor. Um, this too is water cooled and it does generate a lot of heat and we'll have that there. Here's some of the connectors. Um, this controller offers us a lot of opportunities um, in addition to the um, input for the accelerator. Um, we can also um, set this to do uh, regenerative braking and in that um, which is quite difficult with a DC series motor. You can do it, but it's kind of a kludge and it, it, it just never does quite come together. Uh, with an AC induction motor, this is fairly simple. And so we'll uh, set this to when we hit the brake uh, lights, um, it'll basically turn this motor into a generator and, um, and restore some of that kinetic energy of braking uh, back into the battery system. Uh, this controller um, and, and most AC uh, induction motors operate best on a higher voltage than your typical DC system. I'd say most of the DC systems are 144 volts. We were 120 volts in the um, Speedster. Uh, AC systems go as high as seven, 750 volts. Um, this one works pretty well at 300 volts and 400 amps, which is a theoretical top power of about 120 kilowatts. Um, it'll uh, do that and maybe a little more if we cool it pretty well. Um, and that's uh, oh, 120 divided by three quarters, uh, about 160, 170 horsepower. Um, I was interested to find um, sort of accidentally the new torque curve for this motor at 300 amps it puts out 177 foot-pounds of torque that's almost exactly um, what our internal combustion engine is rated for was coincidentally 177 foot-pounds of torque at 1600 rpm I'm not one of these guys that believes you can put um, an endlessly larger motor in a car and um, and thereby improve it. You might be able to up the horsepower 10 or 15 percent and get some additional speed and acceleration. But the engineers that designed this car had a lot in mind when they did it and I'm assuming they didn't make any egregious mistakes when we drove it, it drove great. It's a great car. We almost didn't do the conversion. Yeah, exactly. Brian did not. <laughs> Maybe we can do a different car, Jack. Just let me drive this one. <laughs> and uh, uh, because it drove so well. So uh, I am kind of one of those that assume that uh, the engineering done on the car originally um, uh, was done pretty well. And there's no point in putting a 200, 250 horsepower engine in this car. We're not going to race it. And normally, when you overpower them, um, the, the handling suffers, I think. So I like uh, to, be, uh, to match the power uh, that we had in the internal combustion engine. Uh, and we'll show you that engine out of the car in a little bit. But this essentially in an electric motor with, uh, what would you say, three moving parts, a bearing on each end. Mm -hmm. that's the rotor, the rotor. That's really uh, and in this size is almost a dead match for this engine over here. Kurt, can you get a shot of that while we're talking here? Um, that's the internal combustion engine that we pulled from the car. This is a third of the size, a third of the weight, and, um, and this electric motor here is simply, uh, I think, a more elegant package. Uh, but to be able to match uh, the power output um, of the internal combustion engine with this, um, something this size, again, it's, it's part of the efficiency that you get in going to an electric drive. We have less moving parts, mm -hmm. a smaller package, and we're basically the same power. Exactly. Um, 
the torque on this, unlike the internal combustion engine, is um, going to be uh, available uh, probably at, at the full 177 pounds, a little bit past zero RPM, <laughs> up to about 2,500 instead of just at 1,600. So we should have a lot smoother acceleration, a lot better torque through the low end, and uh, I believe this uh, motor is rated for up to 9,500 uh, RPM, and so we should be able uh, to go pretty far without uh, blowing that up. So that's our controller.